Well, <clears throat> I do think that um, what we're looking at this evening is one of the uh, main tactics that our enemy has, uh, not just the external enemy, the, the, the devil, but also our internal enemy, which is our flesh, to get us to derail, as it were, not to serve the Lord, not to uh, do what needs to be done. Fear is a rather large obstacle that we need to be able uh, to overcome. So this evening, we want to consider how we can uh, overcome fear, and certainly the way we do it is through what Jesus has provided for us by His Spirit, which is what um, Paul writes to Timothy. So let's begin by reading the, uh, the text, 2 Timothy chapter 1, and I'd like to read verses 1 through 8. Paul writes to Timothy, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, according to the promise of life in Christ Jesus to Timothy, my beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve with a clear conscience the way my forefathers did, as I constantly remember you in my prayers night and day, longing to see you even as I recall your tears so that I may be filled with joy. For I am mindful of the sincere faith uh, within you, which first dwelt in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am sure that it is in you as well. For this reason I remind you to kindle afresh the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and discipline. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God. I'm just going to stop the reading there. But notice that Timothy was struggling with the very thing that we all have to struggle with. The enemy was coming against him to make him afraid also of owning the Lord Jesus Christ, doing the work that he had called him to do, the work of an evangelist. Uh, because of the suffering sometimes that entails. He was shrinking back from that. But Paul reminds him that God has not given us a spirit of cowardice. He has given us the spirit of power, of courage. Uh, and that is what will help us to overcome uh, the difficulties, as well as some other considerations we're going to look at this evening. Now, this morning, remember, we were looking at another one of Satan's uh, attacks, which is um, intimidation making us feel inadequate, that we're not godly enough to represent the Lord Jesus Christ, to serve Him, to be His representatives, that we don't know enough to do that, to effectively or effectively to evangelize others because we won't be able to answer the objections, we won't be able to bring a clear gospel. And of course, He also works against our faith that we really don't believe these things to be true. We're not really willing to put our lives on the line or to be counted fools. And because of that, it weakens our confidence, and we're not going to be persuasive enough. So those are the attacks that Satan brings against us. And you know, to a certain degree, he is, of course, right. We are inadequate, at least in ourselves. But we are not in the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul reminds us that the Lord redeemed us and empowered us to do essentially what He planned we would do before He made the world. We are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Now again, we don't know exactly what those works are. We don't know His full purpose for our lives. Uh, those of us who have been in Christ for perhaps many years have discovered something of what the Lord intends to use our lives for. But we will discover more of that uh, before our time ends here. But the point, of course, was this, that we will do. The Lord will do through us precisely what He sent us into the world to do. All of our failures as well as all of our successes are a part of His plan. And so it will be fulfilled. If we belong to Him, He will accomplish His purposes through us. So we need to remember that, that even though... We don't have the strength in and of ourselves. We do have what we need in the Lord to accomplish what He intends to do through us in this world. Now, this evening, let's consider a second personal attack. Again, Satan has many weapons in his arsenal. Uh, 
He is a liar and the father of all lies. He loves to confuse us. He loves to do things to try to weaken and deaden our affections. He tempts us to doubt our salvation. He, as we saw this morning, points out our weaknesses and tries to intimidate us. But he can also make us afraid, afraid of what others might do to us, uh, afraid enough to keep us from doing what it is that he calls us to do. And unless we overcome that fear, we're not going to be able to do what our Lord calls us to do. Now, we all know that, as I mentioned this morning, misery enjoys company. <laughs> we need to realize we're all in the same boat. This is not something that is unique to us. This is something the people of God have had to struggle with throughout the pages of Scripture and really throughout church history. Even the most godly were vulnerable to this temptation. They were tempted to disobey God because they were afraid of what might happen to them if they obeyed. And here's, here's just a few of the many examples we have in Scripture. When Abraham went to Egypt, you'll recall that um, he was what? I think he was about 75 and uh, Sarah, or maybe, yeah, around that age, or maybe a little bit older. Sarah was probably in, you know, 10 years younger than he was, but still quite beautiful. And he was afraid that they might see Sarah and want her and kill him and take her. So he asked Sarah if she would hide the fact that she was his wife. We read in Genesis 12, 11 through 13, it came about when he came near to Egypt that he said to Sarai, his wife, see now, I know that you are a beautiful woman. And when the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife, and they will kill me but they will let you live. Please say that you are my sister so that it may go well with me because of you and that I may live on account of you. Th does this sound like the father of the faithful, uh, one who believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness? Uh, God had made a promise to him of a seed, of an heir, that he would become the father of many nations. He had not yet had a child. The Lord obviously was going to prepare him. This is the one who was willing to sacrifice his son on Mount Moriah, knowing that God would fulfill His promise, but here he doubted, he was afraid. He thought that he might die, and so he compromised. And as we know, as a matter of fact, Pharaoh did see her, did think she was beautiful, did take her uh, into his household. We'll see the outcome of that in just a few moments. Abraham repeated the same thing in Gerar, in, in Philistia, when Abimelech saw her, and he said, why don't you tell him the same thing? And he also took her into his house. And Isaac did the same thing with regard to Rebekah. They were afraid. They were tempted to disobey. And they disobeyed the Lord on account of their fear. Uh, when the Lord told Jacob, when he was in Paddan Aram, to return to the land of Canaan, he left at a time when he knew Laban would be out of the way when he went to shear his flock because he was afraid of what Laban would do to him. Now remember, the Lord told him, I want you to go back into your country. Now, why didn't he believe the Lord was going to take care of him? He sort of scuttled away. Now Laban, when he found out he was gone, went after him and caught up with him at Mizpah. And we read in Genesis 31, verses 27 through 28 and verse 31, Laban said to him this, Why did you flee secretly and deceive me? And did not tell me so that I might have sent you away with joy and with songs, with timbrel and with lyre? and did not allow me to kiss my sons and my daughters. And then verse 31, then Jacob replied to Laban, because I was afraid, for I thought that you would take your daughters from me by force. Again, fearing the man and not trusting the Lord. Same thing happened when Moses sent the 12 spies into Canaan. Remember, 10 came back with a very fearful report that did not reflect an, an iota of faith in the Lord. In Numbers 13, verses 32 through 33, the land through which we have gone and spying it out is a land that devours its inhabitants, and all the people whom we saw in it are men of great size. There also we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak are part of the Nephilim, and we became like grasshoppers in our own sight, and so we were in their sight. And so out of fear, they counseled the people, we cannot go into this land they will destroy us. Saul and Israel 
uh, were actually attacked by the Philistines on many occasions. And on one occasion, they came with such a great army that they, uh, Saul and, and the army of Israel basically scattered wherever they could and hid themselves in caves and even in holes in the ground to get away from them. 1 Samuel 13, verses 5 through 7. Now the Philistines assembled to fight with Israel, 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen and people like the sand which is on the seashore in abundance. And they came up and camped at Michmash, east of beth Aven. When the men of Israel saw that they were in a strait, for the people were hard-pressed, then the people hid themselves in caves and thickets and cliffs and cellars and in pits. Also some of the Hebrews crossed the Jordan into the land of Gad and Gilead, but as for Saul, he was still in Gilgal, and all the people followed him, trembling. Not much later, Goliath comes out from the Philistines to challenge uh, Israel, to send out a champion. And when he did, when he came out, all the Israelites ran for their lives. We read in 1 Samuel 17, verses 23 through 24, as he, David, was talking with them, Behold, the champion, the Philistine from Gath named Goliath, was coming up from the army of the Philistines, and he spoke these same words, and David heard them. When all the men of Israel saw the man, they fled from him and were greatly afraid. You know, the interesting thing is we see fear also in the New Testament. We see it in the disciples of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, remember, as he was preparing to send them out to preach and teach in the the towns and villages of Israel, he said what we read in the meditation. Do not fear those who kill the body but are unable to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. And why did Jesus say that to his disciples? It's because they were afraid or they would be tempted to be afraid. Fear would be their greatest adversary, their greatest obstacles they went out to preach. Peter, on the night of Jesus' trial, remember, denied three times that he even knew Jesus because he was afraid. He was afraid that if he owned Jesus, they would kill him, and he didn't want to die. After the crucifixion, where were the disciples? They weren't out on the streets preaching. They were all you know, basically huddled together in a house with all the doors closed because they were afraid of the Jews. Now, if anybody in the Bible seemed to be fearless, I mean, if you were to, to look for anyone besides the Lord Jesus Christ who really was never afraid, if you were to, to pick one person, who would that person be that, that really was perhaps the bravest disciple? Well, I, I think it would be Paul. But do you know that even Paul was sometimes afraid? We read in Acts 18, verse 9, that when he was at Corinth, the Lord said to Paul in the night by a vision, Do not be afraid any longer, but go on speaking, and do not be silent. And then when he was on the ship to Rome, the angel appeared to him and said this in Acts 27, verse 24, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar. And behold, God has granted you all those who are sailing with you. Now, the force behind the original language here is essentially this. Paul, you're afraid. Stop being afraid. And really, that's what the Lord is saying to us as well. They all failed in this one area, and it's an area that we all struggle with as well, and that is the fear of man. The fact is, we don't want to get hurt. Uh, that's the way the Lord made us. It's a part of, you might say, the, uh, what, the desire of self-preservation. Uh, Paul reminds us, even if it's a different context, it still, uh, still applies in Ephesians 5.29, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it. That's true. We take care of ourselves, don't we? We're constantly talking about how we can actually be better than we are, how we can be healthier, stronger, and certainly if we are in danger, how we could be safer. Now, Satan exploited this particular weakness in man when he appeared before the Lord in order to accuse Job when he says in Job 2, verse 4, skin for skin, yes, all that a man has, he will give for his life. And I think 
that Satan has proved that that is true over and over again through all the examples that we've just seen in Scripture. Now, one thing we need to realize is it's not always wrong to be concerned or to be frightened. Uh, Jesus, when he was looking ahead at the cross and what it was that he was going to suffer, the cup of God's wrath that he had to drink, uh, he prayed that if it's possible, that if his Father's will could be accomplished in some other way, let this cup pass because Jesus didn't want to go through that suffering. There is, again, that sense of self-preservation. There's nothing sinful about that. But it does become wrong. It does become sin when we disobey the Lord in order to avoid suffering. Obviously, if Jesus had not gone to the cross, that would have been sin, which is impossible. If that is where the path of duty lies, we need to walk down that path. We need to overcome that fear. Now, we need to realize that Satan is always going to be there to tempt us to avoid the path of suffering and to take a more comfortable road. The question is, how can we overcome that particular attack of the enemy? Well, the solution, I think you know, is pretty much is what we saw this morning. We need to find the strength. We need to find that ability not in ourselves because we don't have those resources. We will naturally be afraid and we will try to avoid those things. But we can find those resources in the Lord Jesus Christ when we look to God. He has given us these resources in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is what our text is really about this evening as Paul was encouraging Timothy. Timothy, 2 Timothy 1, verses 7 and 8. For God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and discipline. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God. God has given us the courage and the ability to do this, and so Paul is inviting Timothy, join me. I'm suffering. You need to suffer too. But how could he do that? Well, only through the power that God gives him by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is able to take away our fear and to give to us the heart, not of timidity, but a heart of courage, the heart of a warrior, courageous, loving, and disciplined. Really, these three concepts fit together, and I think love is the key because love gives us the ability, love for God and love for our neighbor, to be able to overcome all of our fears, to be able to lay down our lives for the Lord and for our neighbor's good. It gives us courage because, well, for many reasons, it gives to us uh, the power to, to do these things. It, it does give to us self-control, which I believe Paul means by this, the ability in the midst of this situation that we're faced with that may cause us fear to make a reasonable and sound decision, not frantic, fearful ones in which we run for our lives, but rather the ability to trust the Lord to know that He will provide the things that we need. It enables us, I believe, to look to the promises that the Lord has given to us to enable us to go through these things. Remember what Jesus said to His disciples when He gave them the Great Commission, and He says the same thing to us. As you go out to make disciples of all the nations, He says, Lo, I am with you always. So our Lord Jesus Christ is with us, and if the Lord is with us, who can be against us? Uh, Paul reminds us that the Lord is going to work everything that we have to go through in our lives together for our good, even our failures. Paul writes in Romans chapter 8, verse 28, and we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to to his purpose. You know, for those of us who have been in the Lord for a while, again, we know that we've had to face several different circumstances in life and situations that have been uncomfortable. Difficulties, you know, we know the path of duty went through a particular, uh, in a particular direction. 
<clears throat> and we knew that to stay on that path, we were going to have to suffer for it. Uh, there were times when we agonized, times when we were afraid, times that, uh, you know, that caused us a great deal of stress. But we also know that the Lord brought us through those things, and we actually came out better on the other end, and that the Lord was faithful to His Word, and so that we know that we don't have to be afraid as we face the things that are basically in our, yet in our path, and yet somehow we still tend to be afraid. Uh, consider for a moment what happened in, in the case of each of these examples we were looking at earlier where people were afraid, uh, Abraham and so forth. What actually happened in those situations, and did they really have a reason to be afraid in the first place? Remember when Pharaoh took Sarah, or Sarai as she was named in those days, the Lord protected her. The Lord kept Pharaoh from touching her. The Lord struck Pharaoh's house with many plagues until he returned Sarai to Abram. When Abimelech took her, the Lord appeared to him in a dream at night, and he said, you are a dead man because you have taken another man's wife. Uh, the Lord threatened to kill him unless he returned Sarah to Abraham. Uh, before Laban caught up to Jacob, and by the way, Jacob, when, when Laban said what he said, that wasn't all that was on his mind. He wanted to keep uh, Jacob and his family and all his possessions as his. But before Laban caught up to Jacob, the Lord appeared to him in a dream as well, and he warned him. He said, be careful that you don't speak good or evil to Jacob. You know, he belongs to me. So he was protecting him. Uh, the Lord, even though they were afraid, was still watching over them. He was still faithful, even though they were compromising. The ten spies and those who listened to them, well, we know that they weren't able to enter into the land of promise, but there were two spies who believed. Remember, it's 12 percent. Ten didn't believe. Ten were afraid, but two believed. And those were the two the Lord used to lead His people into the land, and they conquered that land by faith. They were able to overcome them because the Lord was with them. Saul was afraid of the Philistines when they came against him with this great army, and, and they were paralyzed, but Jonathan wasn't. Remember, this is the occasion where Jonathan trusted the Lord. He, he thought to himself, you know what? The Lord is with us, and he doesn't need a great army in order to deliver Israel. He goes, he can deliver Israel even through one man. So he asked his armor bearer if he was game, and, and he said yes, and the two of them went up against the garrison of the Philistines. And the Lord brought about a great slaughter of the Philistines because Jonathan trusted in the Lord. When Saul and all of Israel were afraid of Goliath, there was one man who believed that God was greater than Goliath, and he trusted the Lord, and he went out against Goliath, and he slew the giant. The 12 disciples that Jesus sent out to preach, uh, they believed him, and they weren't afraid of man. And they did preach, and they came back rejoicing because of what the Lord had done through them, because they trusted Him. Now, it may be that Peter denied the Lord out of fear, but remember, Jesus prayed for him, and he turned. And afterwards, when he was filled with the Spirit of God, he preached a sermon on the day of Pentecost that the Lord used to convert 3,000 men. And then shortly after that, he preached another sermon at the healing of the lame man, and 5,000 more were converted to the Lord Jesus Christ. The 11 who were hiding for the fear of their lives um, were transformed also by the Lord. They were filled with this Holy Spirit. They began preaching the Word of God with boldness, and they all willingly laid down their lives for the Lord. Instead of being afraid for their lives, they willingly gave their lives in order to serve Him. Paul believed the Lord, and he continued to preach in Corinth, and many were converted to the Lord. Uh, he also went to Rome and ministered the gospel. And many there, we know, were also converted to the Lord, um, even those in Caesar's household. So God was with them to work everything together for good, even when they failed, even when they were afraid. God still watched over them. He still protected them. He still worked all the circumstances together for good because they belonged to Him, because uh, they loved Him and He loved them. But when they looked to Him in faith, He gave them the power to overcome their fear. Uh, 
and to do great things in his name. You see, trust in the Lord, that's important. That's, that's the essential thing. Uh, the, um, uh, Paul already wrote to Timothy that he's given us the spirit so that we might look to the Lord and that we might trust him. The author to the Hebrews writes in Hebrews chapter 11, verses 32 to 34. And what more shall I say? For time will fail me if I tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets, who by faith conquered kingdoms, performed acts of righteousness, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, from weakness were made strong, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. So the question is, how can we overcome the fear that we have of man that we might do the will of God? Well, we do need to believe that the Lord is going to do the same for us that he did for them. Because there's really no difference between us and them. We trust in the Lord. God wants to use us. God will use us. God will help us to overcome our fears if we trust in him. We need to believe that whatever happens to us, whether we suffer or even die, that the Lord is going to use these things for our good. As a matter of fact, he will even use the fear that we have for our good as he helps us to overcome that fear. And we also need to believe that when we do look to him in faith, that he will enable us to go beyond what we are able to do in our own strength. We don't have the resources in and of ourselves. We are fearful. But God can and will give us boldness if we put our trust in him. We can do that because he has given us his Holy Spirit. So we need to learn to rely on the Spirit more and on ourselves less. If we do, Satan will not be able to scare us. He will not be able to frighten us away. We will be able to overcome our fears and do what the Lord calls us to do. Well, may the Lord give us uh, grace uh, to do that. Well, let's, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we? And let's ask that the Lord might give us his, more of his spirit, that we might do more of his work.